big thanks to our podcast sponsor, Hair Care Australia, for getting on board with us for our first season. I have worked with this company for such a long time and have had seen such growth within my business and I have felt very lucky to work alongside them in my business as well as working alongside them in our podcast. Thank you, Hair Care. Welcome to the flagship episode of Salon Rising's podcast. Uh, I am joined here by my best friend and podcast collaborator, the amazing Samara Palazian Co, who is the principal mentor from the Salon Rising group and also the owner of La Sorella Salon on the Gold Coast. Oh, hi, Jen. Hi. So we thought it would be best to introduce each other because introducing ourselves feels fucking awkward. Guys, this is Jen. Me, Jen. Jen. Jen is my best friend of 18 years and she is now involved in our Salon Rising family. So she creates all of that amazing content you see and she pretty much is my hype girl. She is <laughs> the Andy Choo-choo. to my Hamish and you know that movie Beaches, I'm Bette Midler. She's the other character. That nobody remembers her name. <laughs> <laughs> she is pivotal, Jen. She is pivotal. Nobody remembers her name. <laughs> And Jen worked with me in La Sorella for nine years. Yes. And she's only just finished up a month ago. So yes. And now has stepped into Salon Rising. So that's a fun journey that we can speak on as well. But I guess it's really important for us to speak about why this podcast. Absolutely. There the is, why is really important. Yeah. There's so many on this, so many podcasts out there. And it was a question actually that Jen asked me Only two days ago, she said, why? Why the podcast? Yeah. And I think your answer is exactly what everybody is looking for. I mean, we identified the fact that, you know, mothers have mothers groups and, you know, everybody's got their support people, but who do salon owners have? Who do salon owners in the hair and beauty industry have to just be their people, their background? Yeah. So that's why we thought like raw and uncut is so important when we're speaking because we're speaking to salon owners. Yeah. The good, the fucking bad. The burn it down. (laughs) Oh my God, so many burn it down (laughs) moments. The struggles and the highs and the lows. And just so, yeah, like if you're a new mum with a new baby, you need your people. You need your group to kind of hold what you do all they say? together. Like the walking dead, you know? It's just like <laughs> you've just got to find a tribe and <laughs> try and stay alive. <laughs> this is salon owner life. <laughs> so the cool thing about us is Jen has been along the ride with me as an owner. I've been an owner now for 14 years and she's seen it all. She has seen everything. There's nothing that she hasn't seen. There's nothing that I haven't shared. So the cool thing for us is her being able to actually be such a witness to this journey and also be able to share the backside of it. She also has the craziest memory in the world. So if there's anything you want to know about my life, it's not going to come from me. It'll come from Jen. Yes, absolutely. I vividly remember your journey to become a salon owner. I remember what you said that you wanted your salon to be vividly (laughs) I remember nothing what you really wanted and it was a time um oh gosh 14 years ago when we were coming out of working in an environment that felt really rushed and busy and big and it you would you just said I just want somewhere that feels like a community for people that my friends who are hairdressers can come and work at if they want to and this whole list of things that is exactly what you created exactly what you created I told you I remember none of this and Jen remembers all of this I do but yeah that's what we created yeah and it's a super special space And we're known, I guess, in this industry for our culture. And our culture is, I think, one thing that people always are intrigued about. And we want to be able to share that on this podcast and kind of take you through the steps of what's happened with the different guests so you can really get a look and insight into who we are. Absolutely. And I think it's not just about the culture within the salon as well. Like I think that you created a real culture within the industry that, was thriving on community rather than competition and I think that's a huge part of what Salon Rising has become and how it's evolved and the journey that you're taking people on with the podcast and with your mentoring is that you want people to feel like they have the community. 100% because without connection and community like what is there? 
Like without having your best friends, without having your best friends to support you or like that tribe around you that makes you feel seen and understood. I just think we don't want to do this on it. It's lonely. I don't want to do this life on my own. I don't yeah. I don't want it to be lonely. So this podcast very much for us is to get to the wider community and be able to really support and bring you along for the ride and so that you're sitting there nodding your head being like, yes, this is like, oh man, this. I feel that. Yeah. I had that too. Yes. Yeah. Because if you're feeling it, you better bet that everybody else is feeling it as well. No matter how big or little the salon is, no matter how long you've been doing it for, no matter how sparkly it looks from the outside, I promise you everybody else is feeling the shit down in the middle as well. And that's the thing because it's so often it just looks sparkly. People can feel like I'm the only one who's feeling this way. Look yep. at everybody else's businesses. They're doing great. Why aren't I? And that's not really necessary. It's not always the case either. Yeah. Like there's many a times where I probably looked great and I was probably drowning. <laughs> Many a times. Jen laughs because she can think about all of them, (laughs) you know, but we have to – it's a little bit different than normal social media. We can't be as raw and honest as we want on our salon pages because our clients don't want to hear that we're fucking pissed that they won't pay the prices that we deserve, you know. and Or cancel at the last minute. Oh, good Lord. Or, you know, the fact that it's a struggle sometimes to – show up every day we're expected to show up and glow every day for every appointment and that's why we wanted to make that this podcast so that you know everyone feels deeply seen and deeply heard absolutely so today's podcast being our first one was more so on the background of Jen and I and our journey Um, we've obviously told you why we want to do this we also like obviously we have our salon rising which is our like a mentoring space which I stepped into properly full-time about six months ago seven months ago I was just trying to think think it was August I think it's like July or August I don't remember I have a 10 month old I also jumped into this when he was about five minutes old yeah because he was only five minutes old so I feel like it might have been before August it probably I don't know but it's a blur it's a blur it's a blur a 10 month old a business a new business but I had to step into this space because I'm obsessed with being with other hairdressers I think that's me too like I fell into education because of that reason as well I just love hairdressers salon owners anyone in this salon space I started educating hairdressers so I could be around more people in the salon industry but now being able to work along brow artists obsessed you know beauty therapists like we all just feel each other so deeply and we're all so alike and so aligned that this community piece of instead of competition is just where it is at because it's all that service-based like environment yes you know it's all about what you're creating for people exactly right and such a feminine space yeah mate i'm about women i am obsessed with women I am about women. For anyone that is needing any information, I have nine best friends. <laughs> I'm always on the lookout for more. Um, Jen saying no. <laughs> and all no nine of them roll their eyes yeah. and say no All nine no of them are rolling more. their eyes like we're done, we get it. <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with yeah being in cliques of women and men too but like women is just – It's the energy. It's the energy. Yeah. It's this powerhouse energy that I – yeah, I just want to be aligned with at all times. Which you have always been like. So if we take it back then to the beginning. The beginning. The beginning of your no, time. No, of us. The beginning of us, Jen. I feel like people need to Well, know. the beginning of us is your beginning of the time in the True. industry. It is. Again, yep. vividly remember your first day walking <laughs> through Pack Fair <laughs> after your little interview. You were walking down, I think Kukai was, no, Sports Girl was directly opposite and you were walking down the alleyway next to it, back towards I the salon. You, she's a creep. The funny thing is, it, hairdressing is something that you you almost fell into. I did not want to be a hairdresser. And it's innately in you. Oh my goodness. Which is crazy. Like, yep. it's like you were led to it. I was 100% led to it. I didn't want to be a hairdresser. I never had thought about it being a hairdresser. My best friend once told me I should be a hairdresser and I told her, is that all you think I could be? Oh, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so horrific that I even thought that because now it's like my whole life and my like one of the biggest joys and loves. And I hated where I worked so much 
and I didn't like the boss I worked with and I had the most amazing hairdresser. Her name was Nadine. Oh, shout out to Deanie. Deanie. Who was a very, became a very important person in my life and she was one of Jen and I's closest friends in the end. And she was managing a store, do we say the name? It was a big chain salon, everyone can guess. I think that's all we need to say. It was a big chain salon and um, she said, well, why don't you come and be an apprentice? And I was like, nah, nah, I don't see myself doing that. And then I had a horrific day. And again, she said, nope, be an apprentice. And I said, okay. And I think I started a week later. Yeah, you did. So, or two weeks later, I gave, handed my notice and off I became a hairdresser. And at that point, Jen was a senior there? Yes. If Nadine was still there, then I was a senior there. Because I was the manager once she left. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's where we met in those early days. But, I mean, originally, from the beginning, you were different to other apprentices that we had. Let's make it honest. I was different because I also was needing to be the best. (laughs) So if anyone needed anything, it was like a point system. I had to be the best. I had to do the best. I had to like work the hardest. But I've never – I'd never been like that before. I'd never found something that I was so passionate about. But working – I only have – funny enough, have only ever worked with women – I've never worked with a male hairdresser in my... Have you not? No, no you haven't. Yeah, have And not that I don't want to. It's just the fact that it's just never happened. So for me, like, I just wanted to serve women at that point. And I wanted to be the best. I wanted them to love me the most. I was obnoxious. <laughs> but it got me to places I wanted to be because I just wanted to please. Some might say obnoxious. Others might say driven. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with driven, hey? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I just powered through my apprenticeship and I don't necessarily agree with the way I was trained it's very throw you in the deep end I think I was cutting by eight months in I think yeah eight or nine months for sure yeah not well (laughs) I remember I cut someone's hair I thought it was thinning scissors and I like twirled it and cut it and it wasn't thinning scissors that trauma runs deep I still think about it constantly I know where I was sitting like and I just combed it down and hoped for the best but it was a chunk like it, this is this is not a good time for anyone there's a reason you double check your scissors every time you pick them up 100%. <laughs> so I don't think I was trained well I was trained enough I was basic I didn't think I was basic but I was definitely basic and yeah then we Jen went on to manage she was my manager and we became best friends from there so we've been best friends for oh definitely 18 years And we've gone through so much personal stuff together as well as professional. But Jen became my manager and then I became a manager when I finished my apprenticeship. So I finished my apprenticeship a year early. And I think that more so taught me so much of what I wanted and what I didn't want. Absolutely. Yeah. So when did you leave that company? Well, before you became a manager. Yeah. You just got moved. That was in the time that I went back to New Zealand for a year. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I managed and you stepped out of hairdressing altogether. You went While I was Pilates. When I was in New Zealand I did, just because of the circumstances. If you ask Jen, she's done every single profession ever possible. Anytime I think, Oh, that's new, she goes, Oh no, I've done that. Not oh, necessarily no, every, as a profession. every profession. Every profession. That's you've not done all true. the things and all the professions. No, I've mostly just been a hairdresser for like a hundred years. And everything else. But I just did other stuff too. <laughs> True. And so then managing, you know, dealing with staff. I stopped hairdressing because I thought I, – I wanted to become a manager because I actually hated hairdressing at that stage. It was like because but that of was the, the circumstances. That was the circumstances, mate. It was just like here's your next men's cut, here's your next men's cut. Like there was no service to that. And I just wanted to like really take care of humans and there was just there was none of that it was just like such a line and I remember they built a new salon and I even tried to bring in like new music and you know really tried to sit in this space where people were really taken care of and it was just there was none of that and I was never going to get it and all I was doing was managing staff and I think I just ended up going okay I'm out I've got to make this jump well that's when you jumped to home initially wasn't it no I went I was working from home while I worked there as well that's right I did both and then I moved to into you a rented chair. The leap was when you went into the uh, other existing salon. nail space as your own chair. Yeah. Yes. 
So then I was there for 18 months and again, learnt so much. So much. So much about... I don't know how to drink around this <laughs> microphone. So much about myself, how to manage, how to run. And I took on uh, my first employee there and just outgrew that space massively. So it's interesting how the universe brings you what you need because I almost signed... I, w- I needed to move out of there and I almost signed a massive lease which would have taken me under within the first year and I'd signed it and everything and I just went, I can't do this. Nope, this is wrong. And it just felt like everything was such a push. I would have had to build this massive salon which I didn't have the funds for and I was like, no, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. So I pulled out of that last minute and then found our little space, our first little space, Yeah. Um, which was a salon that was actually for sale. So I didn't buy it for the clientele. I had a clientele but more so for our little space that we had and loved and nurtured for 10 years. Yeah, and that space was so many things in the time, like from that conception, it it really evolved so much. Oh, my goodness. In the beginning, there was like you – The clothes. You clothes. I liked the clothes. Clothes, <laughs> jewellery, the mankiest spray tan tank oh, you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Waxing. Anything I could possibly do to make money. That salon was. Yeah. And it was all done. It was, you know, for any – I've still got clients that I've had from that salon and from the very beginning. And they still love it. They were still about that time. Yeah. But, yeah, what we've evolved to now is slightly different. It's exciting. It's very exciting. And it's grown – it hasn't been without its faults. I was 40K in debt at one point. I was severely behind in tax – and I think that's why I've moved so heavily into Salon Rising because of the fact that I feel like I have lived it all. And you don't want other people to feel like that. Absolutely. You don't want other people to go through those experiences. And I don't either. I remember looking at you and just being so worried about you because you were physically sick from feeling so overwhelmed at the time. Yep. And... You worked really hard with the support of, you know, others in our community, shout out Trace, to build so much that I think you come from a really genuine place when you support people. Yeah. You know? I definitely was – I was pregnant at this point. The staff member that worked for me told me she was leaving to move overseas and then it was meant to be two weeks later that I gave birth and I was just like, I don't – I just have to walk away. Like I, either, I have to walk away. I'm just, I just want to be a mom. I remember saying that. I just want to be a mom. Like, <laughs> for like five minutes. For five minutes. And my husband you bought was, a sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you I was about to say that I bought, and that sewing machine hasn't been out in the last nine years. I bought a short sewing machine. And I started making headbands. Yeah. Like it was a thing. I was going to sell them. I've decided they were the worst headbands you've ever seen in your life. And I feel like as this podcast gets bigger, I will share a photo of said headband. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a good time. And that that sewing machine still sits in my house. So, yeah, it was – I wanted to be a mum. My husband was a FIFO at this stage and I was like, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to move on. And I don't know what fairyland I was living in, but that shit was worth nothing. Like if I – someone – I would have had to pay someone to take to it, take it. <laughs> because I had the clientele, but it didn't have anything that was sitting behind it. So what I valued it at, it was not valued anywhere near that. So it was just like a crazy idea at that point. So it was like either walk away from this business, at which point, what do I do then? Or get in there and work hard. And after Alabama was born, my first daughter, I just got this fire in my belly to be like, no, no, I will work hard and I will prove to myself that I can make this business work. But I think that's also where the confidence started to kick in because yeah. that's when you actually started to believe in yourself as a stylist and be like, oh, actually, no, I'm I'm good at this. Oh, I'm really I good know. At this. I reckon that was the time that I was like, I am fucking terrible at this. No. Okay. Perhaps then in saying that, that's when you decided what you wanted to be. you love seeing yourself through my eyes and then seeing yourself – my eyes to me and then Jen's eyes. Jen's like, yes, you just grew. And I was like, because I because, realised I was no, terrible. Because you wanted to though. Yeah. You wanted to grow. And so you put that work in to grow. Yeah. I think up until that point I had this like, 
I am, why would I train? Why would I do anything else? Yeah. Like I know everything. I know everything. <laughs> I can do everything. I'm a great hairdresser. If you look back on that work, I was not. And I was just like, I don't need to do any work. Like I was so egotistical in my own head of how I was like I'm a salon owner look at me and I'm making all this money and I was broke (laughs) but I thought I was making money and you know it just it's so interesting how in that beginning you can sit in such an ego mindset and I think it's almost what keeps you alive in those beginning years I don't I don't begrudge myself for it but afterwards I was like this is when this needs to change like, yeah this is when it needs to change so the first course I did actually went down to um, the fox and the hare with Mia and did a balayage course like a freehand balayage course and I feel like that changed my life I agree more so for the fact that I realized I could be so much more and I felt inspired for the first time in a long time and I realised I didn't know anything and that had so much power in it. Uh, Because I'm a great believer that if you reach a point where you think you know it all, you need to stop whatever you're doing. Agreed. Like you you don't have anything else to offer if you believe that you know everything there is to know. Completely agree. Completely agree. That growth is constant. Yeah. So, yeah, it was interesting and then – from the f- I was telling this story today I've currently got a rising finance program going at the moment and I was explaining to the girls financially where I was at and what transpired over those years and how I came because as much as it's um, strategically where I've got and Jen mentioned Trace before and she is my best friend and she is just sees things in a different way than I see things I'm Absolutely. so creative She's a project manager. So she saw that I was struggling and she knew how to get me out of it. So, And it was simple steps that made sense to me. And I think that's the thing. I think I've been in this industry for 14 years and I feel like I figured tax out five minutes ago. (laughs) I know. Like I actually know what it means now. I didn't until five minutes ago. So, But I genuinely think that that is – the education system being letting everyone – like, who needs to know algebra? Because when algebra time of year rolls around, like, <laughs> nobody knows that shit. Nobody ever uses that again. No, no one. They should be teaching people tax. Yep. Everyone should understand yep. that. And if pay not – Pay as you go. Yeah. Your bass, your, all the different percentages on what you pay on and what you need to put away because otherwise the tax comes and gets you like a motherfucker. And I've had that. And I felt like all my income was taken on tax. And for me, I'm like, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Like I wish I had someone like me that could have taught me how to do this business. But we leave whatever apprenticeships that they are or we leave whatever we're doing and like, you know, whether it's in a salon environment, whether it's just learning like brows, whether it's doing nails, whether it's doing a beauty diploma, whatever that is. And then we decide to create businesses. Yeah. And we're very good at doing what we do. But that's where it ends. And then that's where our downfall happens. Because nobody teaches us, okay, to run a successful business, you can't have just done an apprenticeship. You need to know to put the things away. You need to pay the bills. Yeah. I did not pay the bills for a long time. I like to spend the money. (laughs) And in turn, it nearly took me under. Yeah. So then we got to – where did we go from there? So then I started growing um, at that point a lot. I really started playing with colour. I became a strong colourist because I was excited and passionate again. I think I'd lost my passion at this point because I was just exhausted. So – but funny enough, I had a – I went back to work when my eldest was three weeks old – and I had a FIFO husband and I ran a business and I just made it happen. Like there was just, there was no, I don't actually, I look back now and I'm like, how did I survive that? But I'm just one of those crazy ass people that like 17 balls in the air and that's when I work my best. So it's not for everyone, but. You also had a pretty cool community around you at that time I did. as well. I did. I have an amazing family, an amazing group of friends. Yeah that supported me through this so I'm beyond blessed but that's what I want to create more of for For other other people people. yeah you know not everybody has the community that I have so it's like how do we make that community for people that don't and so that they feel so supported at all times so that you know even starting with this podcast you know for other people to be like 
Hells yeah, I felt that. Hells yeah, like, I've been there. Further the reach. Yeah. <laughs> Bring yep. it to the people. Yeah. Yeah. So then the business grew. I got my first apprentice and then I got my first senior who I will – oh, Jen was my first senior – no, second senior. No, first. No, Leah was oh, first. Oh, no, Leah was first. So Jen was my second senior but she was casual and I remember going to her one night like I really need someone to work for me. Like, and I remember like planting that seed as in like, that's going to be you, Jen, but you need to click onto this yourself. We're at Max Brenner's. <laughs> we're at Max Brenner's, yeah. And we were like, I was like, I really need someone to help me. Like, do you know of anyone? <laughs> and at that point you were doing weddings. Yes. 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 That Because that's when Isla was a baby. So that's when my second was a baby. And at that time... Weddings were weddings were actually great when my kids were really little because I just went to work for one day and made what I could make in a week. So it was cool. But then weddings also came with this locked in feeling that I really don't like, especially with the kids. Like there were two compounding incidents that happened, both relating to um, my youngest, where she got really sick and had to go into hospital and I had to go and do someone's wedding because it was booked and had to leave my baby in hospital to go and do someone's wedding and I never, ever, ever wanted to do that again. And then I also had a situation where I was doing a trial for a bride. I rang you after this. I uh, this. <laughs> I was like, so while I was doing the bride's trial, my then toddler – was trying to make toast in the kitchen without me knowing and was it was almost a knife in the toaster situation. I was like, that's it, I'm done. You go to kindy, I go to work. <laughs> this is how it's happening. <laughs> and to work she came. Yes. For me, the universe put us together yet again. Yes. And then from there, so then we got our first apprentice. Apprentice. And then our next senior who worked full time who – Kira is still with us to this day. Yeah. So we've been through the OG. four babies, four babies together, her and I, um, and she still works at Last Rella to this day. Bless her fucking heart. I love that woman. <laughs> so that's the kind of cool thing about Last Rella is everyone's been around for a long-ass time. Like, they stay. Jen has just left after nine years. For life. Jen has also left and come and gone how many times? Was it just once? Twice. It was only... Twice. You've done it twice. No, I didn't leave the first time. That's when you decided you really needed a full-time senior. Okay. And that's when you had that person come. Oh, I know who she's talking about. No, I forgot about, about that person. And then yeah, okay. that didn't go <laughs> that didn't how... Work. We'll talk about that one day. And that didn't go how you thought. And then you rang and you were like, okay, well, that person's gone and... I really need someone to work. And I said, I can't come. I'm waiting for a plumber tomorrow. And you said, that's fine. My husband's a plumber. I'll send him. <laughs> and then I came back to work. <laughs> it's like, but I can still only work part time. You're like, that's fine. I'll make anything happen. Yeah. See, she remembers that. I don't remember that. Oh, and then the second time you left, you left to pursue teaching, teach writing. Oh, uh, I wouldn't say I left to pursue it. My shoulder was like on the brink of freezing. <laughs> <laughs> Jen gets broken. And then I also had two kids going into school, which meant I had two lots of like vacation care to pay for and the grandparents were still working full time and there wasn't really any backup. So it was just to kind of be able to... How long did you leave for us for that time? Uh, that was about nine months. And every Thursday night she'd end up in the salon. <laughs> With treats. With Oh, I know. But she just couldn't stay away. Every Thursday night she'd end up in the salon. Yeah. And then I think the first time Jen and I ever had an argument. No, we don't speak about those <laughs> things. Meet Hair Care Group, the trusted partner of the professional hair industry. They're a proudly Australian, family-owned company with 45 years of experience, founded by a hairdresser for hairdressers. Hair Care Group are passionate about empowering salons and your teams to make their clients feel their best. They know that running a successful business requires you to wear multiple hats, and that's why they're here to help. With a curated portfolio of leading brands, world-class education, and tailored solutions, they're innovating to make working in your business and on your business simpler. Join our community of like-minded professionals and experience the power of partnership. For Hair Care Group, it's more than hair. 
I can personally say that I have been with hair care myself for over nine years. And from the beginnings of my business to now, it's been supported and encouraged and inspired along the way. I thoroughly suggest you get in touch with hair care for your needs. I think you came to the salon and you said... Oh, oh I did. did come to the salon. And oh, said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to work. I'm going to do some hairdressing again. And I'm going to work at our friend's salon who now, we, we love dearly. Now, prior to me having this conversation, we'd been through a lot of talks on that same night about, you know, scaling down and the costs of staff and, you know, the challenges. Ignore everything she's The saying. challenges she's you were facing with having staff and how maybe that needed to come down a number at that time. So I said... <laughs> well, that's cool. I'm going to do some hair and I'm going to go and do it with one of our friends. And Samara lost it. Yes, she did. (laughs) (laughs) I don't actually remember, but I remember being cranky. You were very cranky. I was very cranky. Yeah. And she worked with one of our friends. But at that point, Jen belonged to me. (laughs) She's my best friend. She comes to work for me, even if I don't have the work available. Yes. Luckily in my favour, Jen came home. So, like full time home. Yes. How long had did you work full time then? Yep. There you go. She came back full time. So it just, you know, I think once you once Jen was so used to the way that we worked and so used to the the clientele we looked after, we pivoted a lot in those few years of yeah. It you know went from clothes and makeup and jewelry and spray tanning and to you know it niche down to just hair just re- and then really and niche then niche down. right down yeah and then I feel like and it's refined the whole situation refined massively yeah we started moving into like really loving color really loving blondes and balayage and then COVID hit and by this point I think we were a team of like seven gosh you we know, just grew we just grew over time and we got more apprentices and more seniors as because that, was, that whole time is a blur. I know. It just wraps into one. Everything from about 2019 onwards, and I don't really know when anything happened. <laughs> I remember it happening, but it was a lot. It was a lot. So we grew substantially at this point. I think Kira started working for me about eight years ago. So eight years ago to now, we grew substantially with quite a lot of staff members. We had a really good family. We've always had a very good culture. We niched right down. We were just kind of doing blondes and that's what we got kind of known for. And then COVID hit. And at this point too, we had moved to the four day work week. So I started that after Alabama was born, my eldest. I was like, I'm not coming back five days a week. So when I um, had my first senior, Kira, I said, we're only doing four days a week. We did Wednesday to Saturday, 38 hours in four days, done and dusted. And she loved that. So it just kind of evolved like that. We lo- we went to the four day work week, and I have never thought about working five days again. Who even does that? I don't know. I it is a I game don't changer. Actually, it's a game think changer. I could. <laughs> Nothing changed. It was a game changer. Nothing yeah. changed financially. It just meant we had more time at home. And also for me, when the salons closed, it's a breath. You know, well, it's peace because you're not even when I'm not in the salon worried about what's happening today. I'm not there, so I don't have to think about it. Yeah, but tomorrow, even if I'm I'm not there, I'm in salon rising. It'll be in my mind. Yeah. Actually, I am there tomorrow. But generally, <laughs> when I'm not there, it's on my mind because I'm thinking what needs to be done. I check my phone all the time to make sure they're okay. And I don't care who you are, but everybody does that. Like, I'm not just going to be like, oh, I'm living free. Who cares what's going on? It's my business. It's my baby. Yeah. I'm going to check in. I'm going to make sure my people are okay. So then from there, where are we at? Oh, then we COVID hit. Oh, yes. And I decided no more men's. We cut men's out. We realised we couldn't work well, Saturday anymore. The The issue was that because it was all when the, like, people per yeah. square metre thing came in. So yeah. we couldn't even all work together at the same time anymore. So we, we had opened to start, our days up. Yeah. We did more days, less people on the days. So some people started early and finished so that the next lot of people could come in and work until late and moving everybody around to try and accommodate this weird you know, ever-changing rules that one day we were allowed to... We, you know, 
do the people on the Gold Coast were pretty lucky with what yeah, we got hit. We with. were really lucky, we were very lucky. But I never forget that night where they decided to bring in the thirty-minute haircut rule. Oh yes, the fuck was that about? And I was like, I'm not doing it. So we worked the day before we found out about thirty minutes. We worked. I started work at five. Yeah, and I worked. I think until we finished almost until like one a.m. We finished just before midnight because you had to be done. That's right. Before by midnight. midnight. Yeah, and I. That's so when the new rule We started came at five. In. We worked till midnight. I still, I'll always remember that day. Yeah, me too. And it was actually fun. Like it was just like it felt like a challenge. We had like a really good Spotify playlist. It yeah. had all apocalypse songs on it. <laughs> like it was. We yeah. had clients come in at like ten thirty at night to get them yeah. done, and then the next morning, my husband came in. I was asleep, and he came in and he said, "Babe, they've cancelled the half an hour rule," and I fucking sobbed, cried for so hours. Much. Because I was just like, I can't do this yeah, like that. yo-yoing of life. Like I'm exhausted. I cannot. I'm exhausted. I was kind of ready for the break, like to whatever this looked like. But you know, even though we were very lucky to be able to work through that time, it was horrific being a salon owner, not knowing how to take care of staff, what happened with JobKeeper, like what everyone was expecting, and I just felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders at all times, and it was. Like you come out the other side of that and you think, dear God, like it was pretty heavy. And, you know, we were trying for our third child during that time. We lost two babies during that time. And I just think that was a horrific time. Amount of pressure that I just felt trying to move through that was pretty hardcore. And I think these are the instances where people need to to understand and come together and be like absolutely I felt the same way absolutely and I, I still feel like I have PTSD from that time oh and so many people do so I mean look at some of our friends who've got salons like in places like Victoria and stuff where that how can you not have PTSD after that and just watching your friends go through that I've got it's heartbreaking. very close friends all over Australia and watching my friends go through that you know it was Horrific, you know. I've got a very close friend, um, Chantel from Talishan, Melbourne, and she's just had a baby. Congratulations! Congratulations! Um, and watching her go through that when she'd built such a powerhouse of a business and really worked hard to make the money that she had sitting there, a very successful business owner, get absolutely torn down with having to lose that it was heartbreaking absolutely heartbreaking and the same for my girlfriends in Sydney like it was just watching that was just horrific and I think everyone was just holding on for the ride and I think the business owners that have come through that even though it was so hard to go through I just feel like we're a different breed now like oh the resilience the resilience yeah yeah for sure yeah so then we changed we actually stopped working Saturdays yeah so we started working Saturdays we always work Saturdays and we started alternating because we couldn't all be in on a Saturday yeah and then suddenly I just went I don't fucking want to work Saturdays anymore and I said to the girls we're going to try this and if it doesn't work then we pull back but we went from seven stylist to 12 within one year of stopping Saturdays yeah so it can totally work based on what you want. And that's that's a real example of that whole situation where, you know, people always talk about, oh, but you can't do that because you're in this. It's like, well, no, you make the rules, right? You make the rules. You decide what's going to work. And the people who want to see you will make that work. And people said, didn't people leave? I'm like, probably. Yeah. But I was more focused on what I can do and creating the life I wanted and giving the same thing to my staff, I've always been about that. And I can hand on my heart say that. And Jen can oh, absolutely. say I'm like that. But I generally don't give to myself what I don't give to my people. Because I don't have double standards like that. It's something that I feel quite strongly about. Yeah. So if I don't work Saturdays, they don't work Saturdays. No one else works Saturdays. Yeah. And that's huge. It just, it now it was a game changer. Oh, Yeah. So, and then we stopped looking after guys. Not that I don't love guys, but again, our space became more feminine and more feminine and more feminine. And the space that we could fit in guys, it was just starting to lose those spaces that we could get women in. Yeah. And it just, we just weren't training in it. It wasn't something I wanted to be specialised anymore. So for me, it just, I was like, I can't give to my guys what I should. Well, it was more the fact that we wanted to be really specialised in what we were doing. And that's not what we wanted to specialise in. Like we wanted to be focused on what we were really passionate about. And don't get me wrong, Lasarilla has our, our three main guys. Oh, 
I guess. We have three main guys that see us at La Sorella. I can tell you all their names and their stories. And they love being La Sorella clients. Like, yeah, that's they're awesome. Cool. They're obsessed with being sort of La Sorella clients. So I think that that was – it's like I love those humans, but they also chose to spend the money that we wanted for Because that's well. the thing also. Nobody said you can't come, but it just became, well, this is the price for the time. Yes, which is really important as well. Like yes. this is the price for the time. Yes. And and I think that's more fair. Yes. It's more fair like – We were charging like $30 for a men's haircut and then charging oh. like 80 for a women's and it just became yeah. the same amount of time and I just couldn't get on board with that anymore. No, absolutely not. So I think that that, yeah, made a lot of sense once we moved towards that. And there were those men like our our core guys who were just like, yeah, of course. I can do that. Yeah. I love you guys. I love being here. I'll pay that. That's fine. Agreed. And anyone else, it was like, that's totally fine. Then came the new salon. Yeah. After COVID, then came our newest oh, baby. The new salon. She's a dream. She beautiful. She beautiful. And the coolest thing about that was we were looking for a space for about three years. And the day I found the space, I remember my husband was in the shower. I was sitting on the side of the bath and I said, oh, I found it. And it had been on the market for 10 months and I'd never seen it. But if I had have tried to get it 10 months earlier, I never would have been able to afford it. Like, well, oh, The timing wasn't right the, at all. No. And it was the yeah. beginning of COVID. Yeah. I would have drowned. So it was interesting that that's when I saw it. And I got all the girls to write. I remember we all sat one day and wrote our wish list of what like we wanted. What we wanted. Like those little things that each person really wanted to be able to see and feel and... So, have yeah, in a new if we space. had this, what yeah. it would look like. And it was light and openness and windows and trees, trees. and, you know, lots of bright and a big back room because at that point we lived in a shoebox. And a separate basin room. That was definitely on the, ba- on the I wish list. It. Yep. So, and then we found this space and I could see it come to life before my eyes. It just made so much sense. So we spent, we got that. I remember surprising the girls and it was one of the coolest things ever is just taking them to this space and saying, this is your new salon, welcome home. And then we spent four months, my husband spent four months building it. Oh, he worked hard. <laughs> oh my God. And I remember the night that I took you there after work oh, and I hadn't showed you anything and yes. I just let you in and like you were like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Because she was designed, like at that point I just knew what I wanted. Yeah. And I was so strong on what I wanted and I had the most incredible designer and she just built this – she just came through. I knew what I wanted but she just knew how to bring it to life and it just came to life. And she's just two years on is still such a magical space and has just worn really well. I can't believe it's been two years. Two years in March. That's wild. Wild. And yeah, so and That's the craziest so thing is one of the babies that I lost was due the night we had our launch yeah. of the salon. And I just was it was nice for me to be able to sit back and think there was no way I could have brought that baby into the world and also brought the salon into the world. Like it was just so much that I thought, Well, I'm not you know, this today I was meant to have a baby and instead I'm birthing this like beautiful salon that I've created for my clients and for my humans and for myself. So it was pretty powerful to look and go, okay, I understand now why, why? it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And now we're here where we are. And now we're here. But I think it's really important to talk about the evolution of you becoming a mentor as well because yeah. that really happened organically. And I think it comes from your – you are a person who cares about other people. You always want what is best for other people. And that began in like an education space as in hair education. But you could really see with the people that you were, you know, when you had people shadowing you and mentoring, it, there's so much more that you'd be like, yes, this person's doing this, but then they're in this bit and I want to make sure they know how to do this bit and that bit. And then the people began to approach and – that's when it began to grow so much because it got to the point where it's like, there's too many. I don't know how to do this anymore. <laughs> I know. It was so organic. Just, I guess, life leads you where you're meant to go. Yeah. And it really, yeah, I started mentoring just off like, oh, I can, you want some help? Okay, I'll just 
Yeah. Let's chat. And it just kind of grew from there. And I started working with Shay from um, Barefaced, which we are in her amazing studio. Yes. We're now oh, recording from so here. So beautiful. And that felt so nourishing for my soul. And then it just started happening organically and more organically. And then I got pregnant and I was uh, tired and sick for a long time. And it takes it, it really takes pregnancy, really takes it out of me. And then the minute, he was born, it was like, I'm ready. I think this is a whole new, I think this is it. I think this is what I have to do. And our first program we launched sold out in like 48 hours. So it just. I have always said you do really, really big things straight after you have a baby. Oh, like after. you That's a time of exponential growth for you. Not for many other people. <laughs> Most people just trying to get out of bed. But that is a time when you just seem to blow up. I think it's because I can't for nine months. I think I'm so depleted for nine months. Yeah. That once that baby's out, I'm like, I can do the baby and everything <laughs> you else. You are so depleted. So depleted. Oh, the crack mattress. I, oh, mate. we gotta, <laughs> that's, that's for the motherhood chat. That will be for the motherhood chat. Yeah, for chat. sure. But, and then it just feeds my soul in a different way, you know? And I just, one of the cool things when you were saying that, one of the first person, people that ever shadowed with me was, is now in my program. Oh, really? And I just felt like that day, it, the day that she shadowed with me, Ashlyn, the day that she shadowed with me, oh. three people were off sick. So she didn't even see our salon working in action. And I felt like such an imposter. Like I was like, I'm such a phony. She's just seen all these incredible artists and then she's finished with me. I remember her. So she's now in my program. Oh, that's so cool. That is the coolest. I just love her as a human, but I just love, and she's always said like, just the way you've run your business is what I felt inspired by. But I remember that day feeling like such a phony educator and the fact that she got so much out of it. (laughs) bless her soul (laughs) and now I get to lead her through business is very cool so I always felt like I needed to be with hairdressers and I thought that was education you know you knew I really wanted to be in the education space quite hard and I wanted to teach hair and blah 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 which you have done which I have done and I'm still doing yeah but now I realize it's it's about being with business owners it's about being able to see their potential it's about championing them to do what they want to do yeah being the cheerleader Oh my God, I love being a cheerleader. I love seeing the shit that happens. And I guess like all my friends and family see it. I think that first thing I said to Jen today was that one of my clients just boomed this yes. last week. And I was just so excited. Just seeing them light up and taking them through the shit I've been through is all mighty and powerful. So Absolutely. Well, you kind of got to know Jen and I. Jen, what are you doing now? So you've left La Sorella. I have. I gave... So- I gave two years' notice to leave two last year. Just so everyone knows, two years. And then and I, I ignored it for a really long time. For three and a <laughs> half years after that. And then I gave notice again. And then I still stayed for another <laughs> five months after that. And then I was like, no, I'm really So she finished really up. going. Christmas was our last week together, working together. We knew that this was it. I don't feel like you really knew it was it until I unpacked my trolley. <laughs> and then she ripped her name off like a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so but that's the difference right it took Jen that long to leave and she if people say no one will ever look after your business like you do no one's met Jen like and I hate that because I know that my salon gets looked after by my people and it's not just Jen but Jen sincerely like put herself first so Jen and I are a little codependent on one another we discovered self-confessed self-confessed codependent yeah but we realized this one day and Jen didn't want to leave because she didn't want me to not be okay and I didn't want Jen to leave because I needed her to be financially okay and it was just a never-ending fucking cycle yeah. of needing to make sure each other are okay but we've had to be big girls and stand on our own two feet absolutely and live without each other but look now we have a podcast <laughs> Codependency in its finest. <laughs> How can we stay together, Jen? Let's create a podcast where people have to listen to us. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing. So this podcast is going to be a ride. There is going to be guest speakers. There's going to be – we're going to talk into business and yeah. motherhood. 
Um, we're going to talk about the hard conversations that we've had and how we have gotten through them. How to have hard conversations. How to have We're hard going into that. We have spoken, we're going to speak on like where we've gone spiritually. We're going to speak on friendships. We're going to speak on, it's not just going to be salon. It will be predominantly salon, but Absolutely. we're going to still be raw with what life looks like as salon owners and how we can really sink into that in all areas. So I would also love for anyone that has any ideas of what you would love to see on this podcast. Oh yeah, send them in for sure. To jump on our Salon Rising page. So the connection with our Instagram pages is Salon Rising will now be our podcast page. Page, yeah. And it'll also be where I share the programs for our mentoring. And then you can find me at um, Samara Palazzi and Co. So the reason for that was I found that it was a king monster to run more than one page and i also run the la sorella page so we decided the best thing to do moving forward was to have everything come together in that one page and you can see my life and how we spend it and then we promote all our programs on there through everything yeah. intertwines through samara and plaza and co but now we will have our podcast page as well so if you want to if you have any ideas and you think God, I would love them to speak on this. Yeah. Please DM us on Salon Rising. Send them through. Yeah. It's like, is anybody else struggling with these things? Probably. Yes. <laughs> yes. Probably. Yes. They are. We've struggled with them before. Yes. Yes. So send them through if you want them spoken about and we will create some content around it. But we're excited for the juiciness that is to come. Absolutely. From this it's going to be so juicy. Do you have any questions, Jen, before we go? You needed some – do you need some quickfire questions? Or you think uh, you I don't think we need the quickfire questions. I just had one thing which I think would be really nice. It's just a single question. There's two sides to it, though, that we could offer for each other. Might be a nice little finish off I love type it. scenario. Let's do it. So we're going to do um, alleviate and replicate – Oh, okay. okay. I don't know what this means yet, guys. So, I asked Jen. I didn't want to know shit today about today, so I don't know what this means. Okay. So, for each other, okay. we're each going to speak about one thing that we would like to alleviate from that person's life and one quality about that person that we love that we would like to replicate. For each other? Yes. Okay, you can go first because I am still confused. <laughs> so, for example... Go. What I would love to alleviate from your life is that – oh, hang on. I had a couple, so I need to think on this just momentarily. Um, I know what I would like to replicate that you have. Okay. I would love to replicate your ability to just be like, yeah, <laughs> I'm doing that. I'm in. I'm just – what? Yep. Yeah. Sure, I'll just jump up. Yep, yeah, I want to jump off that bridge. I'm going to do it. And you will do it. Like, I would love to be that committed to, and just to be so confident in myself. I I'm would just like, like, in the contrast to this, I would like to alleviate how hard it is for you to make a fucking decision. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so it's so hard. I'm like, make oh. this decision, do this. And then two weeks later, you're still like, I was thinking... Analysis paralysis. Oh, mate. I would like to alleviate that. It's a problem. <laughs> so I would like you to alleviate for that for me. <laughs> and then... So that was replicate. Now, to alleviate from you, I think I would like to alleviate from you the sense of responsibility that you feel towards everybody over yourself. <laughs> everybody <laughs> every person in every way that is something that I would like to take away from you I'm trying I'm getting better with the self-care yeah I'm getting better at thinking about what I need it's hard when you've been doing it for such a long time in yeah, every it is. aspect but I am getting better all right I would like to replicate your insane mind <laughs> you are the most clever person this is where I would like to also alleviate the fact that I wish Jen could see herself through my eyes because I'm obsessed with everything she can do. And anything that she puts her mind to, she will do it. It's just making the decision to put her mind to that <laughs> thing first. <laughs> but I would like to replicate Jen's 
insane mind for anything she does put her mind to. So anything that you read is not written by me. My Instagram <laughs> posts are. That's how you can tell it's me. <laughs> but anything on the website and anything is the brain child of Jen and she is so ridiculously clever. Oh, thanks, dude. So we want to end this podcast with a... Journal prompt. Journal prompt. Yes. We're all about journaling at the moment. It's come into our lives quite big. So the journal prompt we want to do is... If you knew that you couldn't fail, what does your life look like in five years' time? I think that it is so wild where I have come, you know, where I never, ever, ever saw myself where I am now that... I think that it's really cool to think about what the future you looks like. Yes. And if you couldn't fail. Who would that be? Who are you? Yeah. And what are you doing? And what money are you making? And what lights you up? And who are you surrounded with? And are you sitting on the couch with me and Jen? (laughs) Because you could. (laughs) Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to our very first Coming and joining us. I... Thank you for bearing with us. This is this is day one. I'm sure in, when we're in season four, it's going to sound very more organic. But day one, it was something we always wanted to do. We can't yeah. wait to take you for the ride of this next chapter of Salon Rising, the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Hair Care Group is a trusted partner of the professional hair industry, a proudly Australian family-owned company with over 45 years in business, founded by a hairdresser for hairdressers. Hair Care Group are passionate about the industry, partnering with salons to provide tailored solutions that empower you and your team to make your clients feel their very best. For Hair Care Group, it's more than hair.